and welcome to another recording of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. As always, we're here to keep you up to date with the latest tech content, news, and wisdom from the world of marketing. My co-host is about on a mission to keep marketing simple, the voice of the Marketing and Finance Podcast, and the host of the Roger Vlog video series. I give you Mr. Roger Edwards. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another show. Great to be here with you again. And it's always a pleasure to spend time with a man who's also on a mission, this time to demystify digital marketing. He's the voice of the content marketing studio video podcast. Here is Mr. Pascal Fintoni. Thank you very much, Roger. Now, this is episode number 13, and, you know... I think that people perhaps, rightly so, could be feeling a little down with the news and the weather changing and so on. So let's see if we can bring a bit of sunshine and a bit of light-hearted entertainment with this podcast today. And let's begin with In The News. Mars rebrands Uncle Ben's after criticisms of racial stereotyping. The move will see Uncle Ben's rebranded as Ben's Original, and the imagery of a black man in a bow tie will be removed from its packaging. Now, LinkedIn, the Microsoft-owned social network, has announced it is planning to launch its own version of Stories, of course, and introduce video chats in partnership with Zoom, BlueJeans, and Microsoft Teams, of course. YouTube has become rolling out fact-checking information panels in the UK as part of an international crusade against misinformation, which started in the US, Brazil and India. Amazon recently revealed that they are entering the online game sector with the launch of Luna Plus, competing against the likes of Google Stadia, Xbox Games Plus, PlayStation Now, Apple Arcade and EA Play. John Lewis is forging ahead with their new content marketing campaign, which includes a new TV advert, a new magazine called At Home, and a Pinterest competition inviting customers to share photos of their recent John Lewis purchases. Now, a firm has been fined £60,000 by the Information Commissioner's Office, ICO, for sending 17,000 nuisance text messages about hand gel without any evidence that the people who received the text had given their consent. And in collaboration with Age UK, Cadbury Dairy Milk has launched a new video campaign called The Originals, asking all of us to take the time to chat and listen to the elders in our lives, as many can go on an entire week without speaking to anyone. Uh, Now, it is true, Roger. Sir David Attenborough has indeed joined Instagram. The account was opened a couple of weeks ago and amassed 2,500 million followers in less than 24 hours. Wow. He's 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 a he's an institution, isn't he, David Attenborough? Everybody loves him. He's just one of those T V stars that just ticks everybody it ticks the box for everybody, you know, and he's Across all generations, you're absolutely yeah. right. And you now, what is interesting is that uh, these. This is about obviously his crusade, probably his last one, uh, bless, around you know the threat to the environment, around mm-hmm. plastic, around what we're doing, obviously to uh, to the wildlife and so on. And I think it's just a wonderful way to to kind of uh, him and his team thinking: How do we reach you know that audience? And let's use Instagram in addition to everything else that we've got. So, but I think you know that would make many many. Um, um, social media experts are very jealous to kind of get two and a half million people to join you in less than a day. I know. I mean, that just <laughs> proves the power of his particular personal brand. But if you think about it, I mean, what he does is so suited to Instagram. It's a surprise that it's taken until now for him to join it. I mean, all of those places in the world that he visits with the production team, putting together those amazing TV programs, uh, you would have thought, it was obvious that Instagram should be on their on their list. Absolutely right. Now, can I talk to you, Roger, about John Lewis? Yes. Because to me, that is exactly what a content marketing campaign should look like. Now, you could mm-hmm. argue John Lewis has the resource, might, and budget to get it right, but actually, you know, the resource is not enough. But this idea of tapping into this uh, the concept and of being at home. Mm-hmm. with a TV advert which is actually celebrating the home environment, a magazine at the time where everybody's meant to be online, I think is interesting, but mm-hmm. of course the Pinterest competition. I think it's a lovely mix. 
I like it a lot. Do you know, it's funny, Pascal, I almost picked, not this particular news item, I, but I almost picked an article about John Lewis for my content spotlight this week. And, and it mentioned this, uh, that they're, they're trying to restructure their whole brand away from the never knowingly undersold strap line that they have. And they're trying to rebrand it around the whole everybody's staying at home because of covid so this does fit in really nicely and you know pinterest isn't a social media uh, platform that i actually use that often it's one of those ones i tend to forget about i have to say but again it, it does fit the brand perfectly and, and encouraging people to post photographs is is just beautiful like it and although obviously you and I spend a lot of time talking about online marketing and as you know I've chosen this as my specialism as a consultant and trainer I still still am very fond of printing media and, and I think oh, yes. this idea of being at home to then consult a magazine which I'm sure would be very well produced is uh, really quite uh, I think it's just interesting but con conversely I am very surprised, not that Amazon has chosen to, to go for the cloud gaming um, kind of sector because there's money to be made for them. I'm surprised by the name Luna Plus because think mm -hmm. about it, which is the way I wrote the news item for you. All the other brands st you know, stuck with their names. So you had Google Stadia, you had Xbox Games Pass, PlayStation Now, all the others essentially led with their own brand. Amazon chose to go for Luna Plus, and I, I'm just a bit perplexed as to why you would not make it any easier for yourself and call it even Amazon Luna Plus, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. You know, Amazon Games, Amazon... Yeah, but why Why just Luna Plus? It doesn't make any sense. It. They're so big, perhaps, that they just think that people will naturally fall in line. But they may well miss a few customers because they don't make that any immediate connection. I would definitely have put the Amazon word in there too. Yes, yeah, strange. I mean, what they are hoping to to achieve essentially is to tap into a, a market that doesn't uh, essentially own a uh, gaming station. You know, so if you don't have the PlayStation or the Xbox or whatever, you'll be able to play games directly by you know accessing the internet. But I just thought that was um, it was interesting, kind of uh, yet another kind of uh, entrant into the cloud gaming uh, world, but with a very, very unique name. Yeah, and, and Pascal, do we really need LinkedIn stories? Um, <laughs> somebody made a joke a long time ago. I can't remember who it was, but when, when, when Snapchat came along and then you had Instagram stories and they put them on Messenger and then they put them on Facebook, somebody once said, you know, before we know it, there'll be Excel stories as part of Microsoft Office. You know, it's, it's almost getting to that, isn't it? You know, oh, PowerPoint stories, Word for Windows stories. Uh, come up with something new, for goodness sake. That's what I keep saying keep thinking these brands should do. Yeah, and frankly, uh, regarding LinkedIn, there are far more important features for them to get right. Mm. Uh, I think video chat, long overdue, so I would welcome that. I think LinkedIn groups need to have a complete rethink to be far more exciting. And if I may address the people at LinkedIn, I am still waiting for my invitation to join LinkedIn Live video. Yeah, and <laughs> LinkedIn Live is 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 a, probably a separate subject for us to have a riff on at some point in the future, but I tried to get LinkedIn Live for 18 months and I applied about five or six times and I finally got it about four weeks ago and now I have got it. I've actually only used it once. <laughs> so if you do get it, Pascal, you'll just have to make sure that you use it for something or we'll have to start giving each other a bit of grief for not using it. Yes, and actually that gives me a wonderful segue talking about creating content. Let's move on to the content spotlights. Now, in this segment, every week, Rosa and I surprise each other with a selected article, podcast, or video. So, Roger, what have you found this week? This is a really interesting one, Pascal, and uh, it's, it, it, there's a bit of a visual element to this. So, actually, I should have, should have not surprised you this week. I should have sent you the visual in advance to get your uh, reaction to it. But I'm going to talk to you about it anyway. I've come across, and it's an American brand, and it's called Smuckers. Have you ever heard of them? I haven't. Smuckers. No. Well, I got... I got it was drawn to my attention by a tweet. So I actually bookmarked the tweet, and I'll come back to that. But this guy, Scott Monty, who's a, a bit of a marketing expert like us, in fact, you read his 
bio and he does similar work to us. He was going on about this J.M. Smucker company in America who have recently rebranded their entire corporate image and they've they've spent by all accounts, a small fortune on agencies, branding agencies who've come in and they've taken a logo which has been around on this company for decades and they've effectively thrown that logo and that image away and come up with something new. And this guy on Twitter is just saying this is an absolute disaster. So I thought I'd look into it a little bit more. So the content spotlight is really, I found an article about it on a website called Baking Business, which nobody will have heard of, but uh, this was the best article I'd f- I could find. And a lot of what Smuckers does in America is baked goods. And I think they originally started off as manufacturing jam. But I would probably describe Smucker as a, uh, a house of brands. So they own quite a lot of very very big American brands like Knott's Berry Farm, which is a massive theme park in um, uh, California, and Meow Mix, which is cat food, and, and Dunkin', which is a brand of coffee. Now, their original logo, which was designed decades ago, effectively is two very stylized strawberries. Very recognizable. You know, it's the sort, even though I've never really heard of this company as soon as i saw the brand i thought well i've I've actually seen the brand before now what their agency have done pascal is they've they've effectively chucked away that very iconic looking strawberry and turned it into uh effectively it's a strawberry shape so it's effectively just a actually to be honest it looks like a guitar plectrum a guitar pick but it's strawberry colored and then there's some other totally random shapes just sort of positioned around this pretend strawberry or guitar pick or whatever you want to call it and when you look at it it just looks like somebody's chucked some shapes onto a onto a board and in a random order and left it there and and so what Spucker have done is they've actually come up with a visual to explain what the brand is that what the brand iconography is actually trying to say? And this is what the guy on Twitter is having a rant about. So, for example, there's an arrow pointing to the, the guitar pick strawberry thing saying, this is the image of our of, of our history. You know, it's a, a stylized strawberry. It's used to anchor the brand with our history, blah, blah, blah. And then there's another bit pointing at one of the other shapes that says creative culture and growth. This, this represents our creative culture and how the company's growing and then it points to one of the other shapes and says and this is the spark this is where our inspiration comes from for our house of brands our pivot point in our on our consciousness and i'm looking at this and i i agree with this guy's conclusion he says if your logo needs this much explanation it's a crappy logo and i have to say that's that's what drew me to this because quite a lot of very iconic brands have gone through this process haven't they when they get to the stage when oh our logo's been in the in, been around for decades we should update it and and they just completely lose everything that used to stand out for them as a brand and i can't help but thinking that here they've gone from something which okay it probably does look like it was designed in the 60s but it's very striking whereas this thing you know, it just looks as if the agency has been having a laugh, to be perfectly honest, Pascal. So I, I guess the, the question I would ask you is, if you do have a brand, and by that I mean the imagery rather than the, let, let's not go into the debate about the culture of the business and how that should be reflected in the brand. We're just talking about the imagery. Should you throw it away and come up with something so off the wall that, you you actually risk alienating some of your customers. Well, Roger, as you can imagine, uh, I've sat in a fair number of workshops and other form of activities around brand development, back mm. to my own days as a marketing assistant, all the way to you know being much older and heading teams of marketing and salespeople. Mm-hmm. What is interesting is every time we went through an exercise of rebranding, 
and where the brand changed quite significantly is because the business had changed too. Mm. And therefore, there was a disconnect between the execution and the expression of the identity and actually what we were selling or what we were doing. So if that's not the case, I think that, yeah, I think it's a fail because all you need then is a refinement of the brand where the colors and maybe some of the expression, you know, the lines or the logo can be brought up to, you know, current kind of um, appreciations and values. But uh, changing it completely, sometimes it feels more like an internal exercise for people to feel maybe more connected with, with the business. And, you know, you were saying, you know, if you have to explain the brand to that degree, you, you fail miserably. Uh, that tends to be the case when people want to get a team, you know, behind the organization. So there's like, uh, you know, values and, and paragraphs and statements and that kind of things about how we're going to change the world for, for, for the better. So I think the only time I have been comfortable with a complete change is because the business had changed completely a new marketplace, you know, a new audience, a new set of activities. If it's the same business at heart, if anything, you should be very loyal to your history and where you've come from. Pe mm. People and customers love a sense of history and, and a sense of belonging with, uh, with brands. It is, you know, part of uh, the nature of professionals in communications to over-engineer, you know, yeah. what we do. But what is fascinating, Roger, is time and time again, when you listen to, you know, reason, it's always simplicity that wins mm. the argument. Mm. The problem, Roger, is that you cannot show off when you do something simple. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, so the, the challenge for yeah. an organization or the agency is coming with something so simple that it's almost embarrassing to send the invoice or to claim your amazing work. That is such a good point. It's such a good point. And, you know, you can just, I can hear the conversations around the board table. <laughs> you know, they, they they were totally bought into this whole, oh, that shape there is about our spark. That shape there is about our heritage. That, you know, you can just see them nodding as the agency took them through the the, uh, the boards or the, or the um, examples. But the fact is, the fact they have to explain this to the customer means that it, is is a miss and I, I i would like to think that they did some at least some focus groups with this branding to to see what the customer reaction was but i suspect that they probably ignored it if anybody came up with the sort of criticisms that we're coming up with here because they'll have bought into all of the gobbledygook i assume that was thrown at them by the agency yeah tricky thanks very much roger now this week uh, i've got an article from mm. someone that actually was mentioned on Two Geeks and Marketing podcast uh, in the early episode, Amy Woods, you know, the okay. founder of Content 10X. Now, at the time, Amy was actually part of our creators um, spotlight and shout out. But today, I wanted to revisit the article that she'd written at the time of being mentioned. Now, the article um, is titled How to Segment Your Content for Ultimate Repurposing with Lessons from TV Talk Shows. I remember, and it was something that I spotted some time ago when she was actually part of the creator shout out. And this kind of stayed with me, you know, sometimes it stays in the back of your mind. And then two things happened this week, which kind of brought it to the fore. Number one, I found myself actually hosting quite a few panel discussions and Q&A sessions as part of virtual conferences and almost felt like a, a TV talk show host. I also came across a lovely LinkedIn post by a gentleman called Jeff Ram. Now, Jeff Ram is a public speaker and he's done really some amazing work around public speaking, but also customer service and marketing. And he mm -hmm. wrote that he himself quite recently felt and that he had emulating the, the better elements of a TV talk show as part of his own kind of service as a public speaker and conference um, host. So I thought, let me go back to the article. And so to begin with, Amy, of course, would uh, showcase her, her kind of uh, understanding of content repurposing. So the article also has a introduction, which is a video. So for about 90 seconds, she's going to explain what this article is all about as a bit of a teaser. She's also, of course, done an audio version of the article. And then you can read the article, which is interspersed with visuals and animated GIFs. 
What is interesting about the the article, she is explaining something that I didn't fully understand. Now, you and I use segments for Two Geeks in a Marketing podcast. And actually, it was part of the fun bit of pre-production for you and I to kind of discuss and agree and settle along with segments we're going to go for. But what she's saying is that the, the reason why you want to use segments is not just to make it more interesting as an entire episode. It, it is likely that you could actually grow an audience who will only listen to one particular segment. Mm. Mm. And, and I must confess, Roger, I, I never kind of thought about it in that way so clearly. So what she's saying is that you want to make sure that you have individual marketable segments. And moving away from the kind of tried and tested methods of, you know, an intro, then a main body of work, then an outro, you want to have segments and to almost welcome the fact that you will have an audience that will only consume one segment and will never consume the whole episode which I thought was just an interesting one. So then she's m making examples of, uh, for example, the James Corden late, late Show, where the show that you know uh, he produces became popular because of one segment, which was the Carpool Karaoke, mm -hmm. uh, which has then done the, the runs all over TikTok and YouTube and, and Instagram and so on. And what, what she's saying is, therefore, part of uh, our ambitions as content creators is to have two types of audiences, one that will consume the whole of the episode, and some will only consume their favorite segment, and we should be more than happy with that. She gives some examples of kind of segments that could be part of a typical production, whether it's video, podcast, or even a blog, you could argue. So she's saying maybe you could have some quick fire Q&A. Maybe you could have some headline news, perhaps a tip of the week, perhaps some podcast reviews, maybe give a, a support of the week shout out, maybe share some hidden gems and maybe run a competition. But all those are individually marketable segments. And that's what we're doing with Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast, of course. So I, it's obvious that there are probably people out there that maybe just tune in for our film marketing segment you know that that will appeal to some people they'll tune in and fortunately now we can use the time stamping feature on youtube to make it easy for people to find that particular segment so I, i'd be actually quite interested for anybody watching or listening to this episode if, if you agree with this just drop us a comment below and let us know if you tune in and just listen to either the film marketing segment or the content spotlight or the content shout outs let us know because it, it's it's absolutely fascinating but you know amy's absolutely nailed it here um, and that's why those sorts of shows are so consumable um, i'm just thinking back to the you know shows that i've used, used to watch on saturday nights like noel's house party and uh, i guess as Ant anton deck did a similar sort of thing there were always segments where i would think oh that's the time to go and make the cup of coffee or to go and get get another bottle of wine or whatever it might be um you know so yeah i can absolutely see that and and it's really interesting that nate uh, that amy's homed in on this um but it it's a good way of, of of widening your appeal and talking to different audiences within the same show absolutely and you and i spoke about the possibility of actually creating video extracts of mm -hmm. of the show and frankly, I am now very encouraged to go ahead and literally find ways to distribute only film marketing with its own mm -hmm. intro and outro, with obviously calls to action to go and consume the whole episode. But I think you and I should then be okay with people saying, no, I'm all right. I just love the in the news bit, or I prefer to only listen to the content spotlights. And it's just something that I thought was just very interesting and a good reminder that um, you know people will appreciate your work in so many different ways. And your role as a content producer is to actually make it as marketable and accessible as possible. Absolutely right. Well done, Amy. Nice one. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Roger, let's move on to marketing tech and apps. Now, this is my favorite part of the show, only because Roger always manages to surprise me with the selection of marketing tech apps and gadgets. Every week, we choose one or two little solutions out there, either that we use or we've just discovered, and see whether or not this could be of help to you as well. So, Roger, what have you got for me this week? 
Pascal, this week I'm looking at podcast apps, which is really apt, I guess, given that this show goes out as a video and as an audio podcast. But what prompted me to include podcast apps this week is the fact that iOS 14 hit the streets this last week and of course like everybody I updated my iPad I updated my iPhone and then as when I went in to listen to my podcast and check that two geeks was all right lo and behold they've changed the podcast app within the Apple infrastructure and I couldn't find how to to do some of the things that I've been doing on their podcasting app for for years and years and years, and I got quite cross with it. Um, and it's a why, why do they why do they change the position of the buttons or make you swipe a different way? I can't find my way into my own library now. So it prompted me to go back into the app store and download a few podcasting apps that I've used in the past. Now I've used Stitcher before, which is okay, but one that I have used from time to time, and I've got it back on my phone, and I want to call it out, is called Pocket Casts. Now, what I like about Pocket Casts is it's got a few things in it which are a little bit gimmicky, but they're quite, they're quite fun. One of the things that Pocket Casts does is if you're listening to a podcast, you know how, you know, I don't know whether you're like me, but when I listen to a podcast, I usually put it on 1.5 times speed, so it's a little bit faster, um, so I can get through more content quicker. And now you can do that on Pocket Cast, but what Pocket Cast also does is it sort of scans ahead, and if it comes across any silences in the in the podcast, so for example, say an interviewer asks a question, and then there's a five second pause before the person answers the question, Pocket Cast just cuts it out, so it, it reduces those little gaps. Now it's a it's a bit of a gimmicky thing, but it 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 just makes it a bit of a quicker experience, and I I really quite like that. Uh, what it also does a lot better than than Apple is it gives you suggestions of other podcasts that you should listen to based upon what you what your is on your favorites list. Now Apple does this and other podcasting apps do this, but sometimes they just get it completely wrong. You know, I'm a marketing guy so I tend to listen to marketing podcasts or film podcasts, bit of comedy. I don't want to listen to a gardening podcast, you know, so that should never come up as a as a, a, a example for me to listen to. So I just love those little quirky things that Pocket Casts has. But then I thought, do you know what? For me now, I think the ultimate podcast listening device has got to be Spotify. Now, you can get uh, Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast on Spotify, which is which is fantastic. But it, and, and, and Spotify does exactly what Pocket Cast does, and it gives you suggestions. And a lot of the suggestions, again, better than the Apple algorithm at pointing me to podcasts that I might like. And I've mentioned a few of them on the show in the, in the, in the past few weeks. But sometimes if I'm going on a journey in the car and a few weeks back I drove down to um, to Newcastle to see you and, uh, and and Richard so that takes me about an hour and a half I like to queue up se segments of, of podcasts and episodes Apple's podcast only uh, app only allows you to queue up one after the one you're listening to now if that's a 15 minute podcast it's no good if you're on an hour and a half journey um, and you definitely don't want to be messing around with your phone in the car spotify and pocket Cast as well by the way allows you to queue up as many episodes as you want but of course the genius thing and i this honestly pascal th this bl this blows me away that i hadn't realized this in the past but because Spotify is effectively a music app, I can actually queue up a piece of music in between each episode. So I'm driving and I get the best of both worlds. So I'll listen to episode one of um, a podcast, uh, Marcus Sheridan's podcast, then a Genesis track, then episode two of Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast or, or um, Sarah Archer's uh, Speakers Club, and then some Jethro Tull or some Marillion. And, oh, I, you know, that the, 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 that's so bleedingly obvious that you can do that. But for me, I just hadn't made that connection. So now when I'm driving along, I can truly come up with a playlist which encompasses music and podcasting. And that, to me, is just fabulous.
That's brilliant. So you're essentially organizing your own radio show for yourself. Yeah, and absolutely. Is that using the Spotify Premium? I take it, or the free version? Uh, I do actually have Spotify Premium, um, but you can do it with the the free version. You just have to put up with some adverts yeah, between each I mean, track. I mean, I use Spotify not very regularly, so I've got the free version. I don't find the adverts actually that uh, kind of intrusive for some reason. Maybe because they are audio based as well. But I didn't know about Pocket Cast. So, yeah, once again, you've surprised me uh, with. So, that's, thanks very much for that. Roger, I want to continue my little journey of discovery about all things Google, if you don't mind. Now, very recently, but I know that you will not realize that's the case, a couple of new Google apps were introduced to your Google account freely. So, I want to talk to you about Google Collections and Google Jamboard. So to begin with, are you aware of Google Collections? I haven't heard of either of them, Pascal. I know. <laughs> so, you know, please Google, and all the others for that matter, when you invent something, can you please tell us, you know, so we can yeah. get excited. So if it wasn't for me being just a bit too curious and obsessive about things like this, I wouldn't know about it. So um, Google Collections is essentially a bookmarking uh, feature that allows you to save pages save images and save locations from Google Maps into folders called collections. Those folders that can then be shared with others who can then add to the collection. So it is a curation tool. You know how fond I am of content curation. But sometimes, you know, as part of this show or for the work that I do, I come across an article, but I'm 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 traveling maybe or I'm doing something else and I want to save it. And what I tend to do at the moment, uh, Roger, I email them to myself. Yeah. which is not a good idea because my inbox, frankly, is should be with something else. And if I remember, I put it on Flipboard, but then if I put it on Flipboard, it's not easily shareable. So Google Collection is very easy. It tends to be a little easier to access and use on mobile phone. And you'll see now when you go on a page or when you search on Google or when you go on Google Map, you're going to see the little bookmark symbol. It's like a little uh, drop down banner or flag, you know, that symbol with that kind of two pointy uh, ends on it. And if you tap on it, it will ask you, you know, where you want to save that page, that image. And that place. So if you are uh, like me, always consuming content, want to save the article to be used or curated again, Google Collections could be a nice addition. And of course, uh, it fits within the Google ecosystem. Now, Google Jamboard. Yes, it appeared a few months ago now on everybody's Google account, but no you know, message from Google. So there's two versions of the Google Jam board. Jam as in jamming music-wise as opposed to the preserves you can consume. And it's the idea of note-taking during a discussion with others. So they have a physical Jam board. Think of it as an interactive plasma screen where you can use that to jot down notes, have Google Meetings. You can also access Google Drives. It's all about accessing the different Google apps. But what is nice about Google Jamboard, imagine like a, a whiteboard and you can add sticky post-it notes that you write on. So if you were to have a, a Zoom meeting, for argument's sake, with a team, and there's always somebody that has to volunteer to take notes, which is, I think, very unfair. So the idea being that once you have the Zoom meeting, you can have a second browser open and give you access to the board where literally you jot down your ideas, your suggestions, or your comment in little sticky notes. They can have different colors. You can change the font. You can put your initials against it and so on. And when it's finished, you can download the Jamboard as a PDF. And then the team has all the notes and all the ideas from the conversation. So for argument's sake, if you and I were to plan, you know, the next few seasons of Two Geeks and Marketing Podcast, we could go online, jot down all the ideas by the for bit film marketing, all, all the different tech for marketing tech and apps. And then we have a document that we can use, you know, for ourselves. And of course, because it's part of the Google ecosystem, it can be saved on Drive and you can get people to join you remotely. So Google Collections and Google Jamboards, they've been offered to you freely by Google. You, you will see the icons on your Google account, but of course, no one knows about it. Well, I do now, Pascal, so thank you for that. So we've been talking about apps for the future, but Roger, I'd like to go back in time with This Week in History. In 1876, the first two-way phone call over outdoor wires is demonstrated by Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Watson, who made the call between the cities of Boston and Cambridge. 
Now, in 1946, the Hallowit Company invents the word xerography to describe a brand new process we now know as photocopying. It became such a huge success that Hallowit changed their names to Xerox. Ah, in 1946, one year after the Second World War, the first Cannes International Film Festival takes place with over 40 feature films and more than 60 short films submitted by 21 countries. Wow. In 1955, after 11 years of continuous service, the ENIAC computer is retired from service. Located at the University of Pennsylvania, ENIAC occupied 1,500 square feet of space and weighed 30 tons. In 1964, the Shinkansen network of high-speed railway lines in Japan opens with the first trains travelling at 210, that's 130 mph, 210 kilometers an hour also known as the bullet train the current models can achieve speeds in excess of 300 miles an hour in 1968 cult zombie film night of the living dead directed by george a romero premieres in pittsburgh shot in black and white and on a budget of over hundred thousand dollars it began the zombie film genre we know today and where has that led? Goodness me, so many different films. In 1992, the video game Mortal Kombat is released into arcades and will quickly make the headlines for its graphic display of blood and the deadly finishing moves. And finally, in 2011, technology visionary and founder of Apple Computer Chief Steve Jobs passes away after a long battle with pancreatic cancer. Together with Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs started the personal computer revolution and kick-started a new era in technology by introducing the iPhone and iPad to the world. Indeed, indeed. I'm just thinking about those bullet trains, Pascal. Mm. You know, the Azumas that have just come in on the East Coast line, uh, which I haven't actually had the uh, um, pleasure of travelling in yet. Now, I think, if I remember rightly, the last time you came up to Edinburgh, you went in an Azuma train and, and, and wasn't particularly um, impressed with no, it. No, sadly, they, they the seats were extremely uncomfortable. Uh huh. I mean, they do look like bullet trains. They're very, very high tech on the outside, and they do look very modern, but it's like a lot of things these days. You find it, you know, with aircraft, you get these great aircraft that are being built, you know, great and better for the environment, bigger engines, less fuel burn, but go inside them and they're just tiny cramped seats, which are really, really, really uncomfortable. So yeah, please do build bullet trains, but make them comfortable inside as well. I couldn't help but be quite impressed with uh, the first Cannes Film Festival taking place a year after the Second World War, where the world would have been in quite a state when you think about it. And yet, despite all of that, 21 countries rallied up to submit, you know, as you mentioned, over 40 feature films and 60 short films. And I can't help make the link between you know, that and what we are going through today. And I'm assuming that it's going to be possible to still find a positive and pull through and still you know, be able to, to contribute to quite innovative and exciting events. Yeah, I, su I, I was surprised by that as well. I mean, when when did they make all of these films so, so soon after the war? But, you know, industries carry on, don't they? Um, things happen. And, and the TV and film produ production people have found ways around the COVID scenario. They're, they're able to film even the soap operas with social distancing, but use camera trickery to make people look closer together than they actually are. Yeah. I must continue about film and mention to you, of course, George A. Romero, Night of the Living Dead. And as you mentioned, what a legacy. I mean, there's countless number of movies and series, not all good. But if you think about, for example, you know, what has happened with Walking Dead and, and all the others is really quite, quite a legacy. And if, if you allow me, I actually met George A. Romero at my very first Comic Con wow. in London. Wow. Uh, 2014, uh, I think he passed away a little after. I've got a little uh, prop for you. So for our listeners on podcast, I'm showing uh, Roger <gasps> a cover of Dawn of the Dead signed by George Romero. Dawn of the Dead being actually the first zombie film I saw, which scared the bejesus out of me. I didn't sleep well for a night. I told him he was laughing when I told him. And it was such a sweet man. And we, we spent, I would say, for me, 
like a, a long time, probably was very short talking about obviously his work. It was so unassuming and you know, almost kind of brushing away when I was saying, I mean, but do you not realize the contribution you've made and, and how you've inspired so many filmmakers, producers and actors out there, but it was just happy to say hi to the fans and sign you know, covers of, and t-shirts and, and so on. I came to the conclusion, in fact, I had this conversation with my wife this week. I think fast zombies are scarier than slow zombies. And, and the reason why I've come to this conclusion is we've recently watched uh, a Korean zombie film. It's called Train to, to, Ooh, Train to Bazan. Yeah. And these zombies are, they, they run like, marath- like sprint runners and they are scary. I also watched uh, this week this, the sequel to Train to Bazan, where, which is called Peninsula, which isn't actually as good. It's worth watching, but it's not as good as Trains to Bazan. But I think the original zombies in Night of the Living Dead were the, probably the slow, plodding ones that sort of creep up on you without without you knowing until it's too late. But fast zombies like Train to Bazan and nine, uh, 28 Weeks and 28 Weeks Later certainly certainly scary to me yes and, and i think for that reason the remake of dawn of the dead which is my favorite which is why i got george romero to sign it um uh, the remake with uh, Zack snyder you know at the uh, director's yes. on director's chair there were fat zombies and that was again a jumpy scary one I can't believe we just had a conversation about slow ver- <laughs> zombies versus fast zombies. <laughs> Shall we ask our viewers and listeners to tell us what they think as well? You know, so, yeah. slow versus fast. As- absolutely. Put a comment in the uh, in the chat below and let us know: Are you a slow zombie person or a fast zombie person? We yeah, probably th- better move on, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> thinking about uh, the list of what, what you know we've read out for this week in history. Actually, I've just realised the current thread. The, the common thread is uh, legacy. Mm. All of those from, you know, Alexander Graham Bell to Steve Jobs, it's all about legacy and, you know, we should find ourselves very lucky and grateful to be living in the times that we are going through. Absolutely right. Talking of uh, being grateful, should we go for our creator's shout outs? Let's do it. Okay, Roger. So who today would you like to celebrate and whose work would you like to give a shout out to? I'm going to do a shout out for a lady called Catherine Knowles. Now, Catherine is uh, one of my clients, so I've helped her and her financial advice firm with their marketing strategy for a few years now. And Catherine is just awesome at content marketing. She's one of these people who's just embraced a lot of the things that we do, a lot of the things that we talk about podcasting, using quirky ideas in their website and in their advertising and in their videos. And she she's, she really stands out and she's won quite a lot of awards in the financial services industry for the work she does with content marketing and on social media. She recently released, uh, launched a podcast it's quite specialist, so I'm not actually suggesting that everybody who's listening to this, unless they work in the financial services industry, go and listen to it. It's called the Practical Protection Podcast, so it's actually about insurance. Um, but there is a particular episode which I think everybody should listen to, and that's really the, what the shout-out is about today. On the podcast, Catherine interviews another lady and this lady is called Vicky Churcher. Now Vicky works for a company called AIG. It's a it's a big financial services company. I actually filled in for them as a as an interim PR manager whilst uh, somebody was on maternity leave about 3 or 4 years ago. Vicky had a really nasty health scare recently in that she had serious heart failure and she ended up having to have triple bypass. And then she had a recurrence of the condition and had to go into a hospital and have another um, operation. And it it turned out that this this was a, um, a, a condition that she'd been born with. And the fact that she had this illness prompted her to have her children tested. And it, 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 she discovered that the... The, the problem could happen to them as well. And fortunately, that's allowed her to get them treatment and, and get them, um, I suppose, monitored uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen to them. But Catherine 
as an interviewer, I, I, I actually just as a person to work with, she's, she's incredibly empathetic. She's got a great way of talking to each other, to, to people, to understand how they feel, and, 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 and especially in an emotional situation like this. And it's just the way she gets Vicky to explain this quite horrible um, situation that she's been through with her illness and the effect it's had on her family and everything. But Catherine's so empathetic in the way she goes about it and, and Vicky's so naturally enthusiastic but also she's telling a serious story so there's that sort of edginess to it. It's Even though it's an insurance podcast and even though most of the people who are listening to this show are probably not interested in insurance i'd still think that even if you all you learn is how to be is how to show empathy and how to interview somebody in that sort of scenario it's definitely worth giving that episode a listen so i'll put the link to it in the show notes thank you very much roger well i've got something you could argue a little similar to your selection so my shout out this week is going to mike morrison and callie willows from the membership um, guys they are celebrating five years of membership academy this week so as we're recording uh, this episode in happy birthday five years so i think they'll be running the membership guys for about eight years i would say give or take and five years for the academy where you can learn to plan create and obviously grow a successful membership website but the reason i want i chose them this week is because once a year they basically do a big um, podcast where they recall themselves in conversation having a bit of a review of the year and sharing their plans for the future and I have to tell you Roger even though you and I would know Mike and Kelly personally and professionally it was an absolute delight to listen to their very honest conversation and it was almost like a lesson in business management and business operations. So even though very much like you said, you know, uh, membership websites and running a community may not be of interest to you, I think there's something very, very interesting and engaging about listening another, to other business owners about the highs and lows of the last 12 months. And you could argue that for them, uh, like everybody else, it's been a year of two halves. So they tell the story that, you know, the year started uh, rather well with the Retain Live conference and the launch of the book and many other activities for their members. And then come March and then suddenly everything kind of goes, you know, very, very differently. So I, I just wanted to kind of bring that to everybody's attention uh, that you, you can actually be inspired by a very honest account of someone's efforts in running a, a, a business in addition to which you can also get inspiration in terms of their content effort I don't know about you Roger but I've always been quite impressed about the depth and the details in which Kelly and Mike can go into about membership website and the running of membership website they always seem to have something to explain and and talk about and again even though someone who's listening to us may not have plans to run a membership website, if you are looking to grow an audience, no matter which format, and if you are looking to essentially have you know uh, people to uh, adopt you know your way of thinking and follow you on social media i think you can get lots of tips and strategies so they have a great blog and i have to tell you i'm very fond of the artwork they they have this visual identity with, with, with a blog article that i absolutely love and they have two podcast series one is called the membership guys podcast which is hosted by uh, mike and then one which is called behind the membership hosted by Kali. the first one is about tips and strategy for membership site managers. And then the other is actually Kali in conversation with the, the individuals who are running those very membership websites. So there's two styles. Uh, Kali's done already four seasons with 10 guests. So that's already 40 episodes. And this bank of information is freely available. You don't have to be a, a member just yet. But let me tell you that you're bound to be impressed and take something away about how to engage with an audience. I'm going to dive straight in and listen to that after we finish recording this episode, Pascal. I'm also hoping that uh, uh, Mike and Callie's cat makes an appearance. Uh, they've got a cat called Willow Bean, and uh, I often see Willow Bean featuring in their Instagram posts. So I'm hoping that uh, he makes an appearance in the in the show. Super. So thanks again, Roger, for your selection. And for all of you, please do go and say hi to our, our creators. And thank you for listening to the shout out. But... Time has come, Roger, to move on to the final segment of today's episode, film marketing. Let's get into those films. Right, Roger. 
Today is a very special film indeed. Celebrating 35 years, 35th anniversary, it's just been celebrated by Warner Brothers. We are talking about The Goonies. Goonies, my goodness. I mean, Pascal, how did it get to be 35 years? But as always, when we have these little trips down memory lane, it does bring back so many fabulous memories of our younger days of consuming these films. Now, I remember, I think I might have been a little bit reticent originally from going to see The Goonies. Um, it came out in 1985, as you say, and there was lots of great films coming out around that time, Back to the Future, which we've already talked about on the podcast. In Indiana Jones was around that time. Star Wars 3 was about uh, Re um, Return of the Jedi, was a little bit before that. And I just thought, oh, do you know what? This this looks like a silly film with kids in it. And I didn't really think it was go I was going to enjoy it. Um, but I went to see it, and it was just such great fun. And in, in some ways, it was almost like uh, children pretending to be Indiana Jones. Now, that sounds a bit naff, but they just pulled it off so well. And it was one of those great, great films where the, the, the cast were just, even though they were young, they they felt you felt as if they'd been acting and working and living and playing and adventuring together for years and years. It was just a magical combination, and and I think it, what did sell it to me in that in that time was that sort of I'm watching Indiana Jones or young Indiana young Indiana Jones or even I guess a sort of Tomb Raider type thing, although that's sort of out of sync in terms of time. But looking back. I might never have gone to see this film, and oh, yeah, I mean, it was, for me, it was just such good fun. I, I just couldn't wait. So my parents actually bought me the the book. You know, every film back then was getting a little novelization. So I read the book, and it was a few weeks before we managed to go to the cinema because for us it was quite far. It was always quite a long drive in the car to go and see uh, this film. But there was you know trailers, there was people talking about it in the streets and so on. And for me, it was like you know, so it's like pirates, a treasure, a treasure map traps uh caves tunnels and yes. baddies you know the Fr fratelli brothers um i mean it was just so, so magical and i think for me also it was the first time where there was actors about my age because mm. in, in 1985 I would, have, I would have been 16 roughly and i think it was roughly the the average age of the actors or the characters suddenly so for i mean i i think would be i don't think people have not seen the good news but if you haven't please rush. Uh, so the reason why we chose it as well, Roger, today is because 35, 35th anniversary, Warner Brothers are releasing a 4K box set, which looks like a little treasure test, where you can you have access to your 4K, your Blu-rays, your cards, your treasure map. There's all kind of anniversary thing going on there. But for me, it was this idea of it was with kids, but actually, they was quite edgy. I mean, this movie actually got quite a few scenes cut when it was shown on television back in the days. So, firstly, they had to cut the swearing. So. Mm -hmm. Inf uh, the infamous kind of claim by ITV in the UK was, well, it can't be for families because they say the S-H-I-T word 20 times in the film. That's unacceptable. <laughs> then you had, obviously, some of the, the tension, the uh, kind of Fratelli brothers were quite menacing. Then you had, obviously, some very strange moment with uh, Sloth, uh, which had to be cut as well. So uh, for those people that watch it on TV, it was so kind of cut back that when they discovered it again on DVD and, and Blu-ray, they went like, this is a different film. I don't remember half of those scenes. Mm, mm. And it's also one of those films, Pascal, which uh, when you're a film buff and a film geek like we are, I, I just love seeing actors in films and trying to make that connection. Well, where What have I seen them in before? Where do they go on to? And this is almost like, again, a treasure chest of actors that have gone on to do bigger films later on. Now, Corey Feldman, who plays Clark Devereaux in, in, in The Goonies, he went on to be in The Lost Boys. He was one of the Frog Brothers in The yeah. Lost Boys, which is a, another fabulous film that we probably have to talk about at some point on the show. <laughs> Ro Robert Davey, who was one of the aforementioned Fratelli brothers, you know, the, the, the baddies, he went on, to, he was in Die Hard. He was also the baddie in the second Timothy Dalton Bond film. Um, he's such a such a great looking baddie him and and this is one that you probably don't know 
um, is Anne Ramsey, who was Mama Fratelli, who I've always thought was quite a scary-looking she woman. She was, yeah. Uh, she was actually in Every Which Way You Can, which was one of the uh, Clint Eastwood films with the orangutan. And, and I'm pretty sure, and, and I can't remember now, she was also in a film where there's two, two people on a train and the, the, one of them is an author and he's trying to work out how to start a book and, and they're trying to work out whether they should murder this woman. And in the end, she just gives him the line to start the book after he's been trying to start the book for years and years or, or, or months and months. And that's, he says, right, we're going to kill her. We're going to kill her right now. So I, I just love th- this. is one of those films where every single actor in it has gone on to something or has been in something. And that for me is just as enjoyable as watching the film itself. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, obviously what we had here were three incredible storytellers coming together. Steven Spielberg, who came up with the story and helped mm. produce it. You had Chris Columbus who then, you know, brought the screenplay based mm. on Steven Spielberg's story and then Richard Donner who had the enviable uh, <laughs> job of directing and when you watched uh, the making of documentaries and all interviews basically Richard Donner complains about uh, how unruly and excited you know all <laughs> the actors were but you can't blame them can you I mean literally some of the set designs are incredible mm-hmm. and if you are a young actor for, for people like Sean Astin who went on to do m- so many movies, including Lord of the Rings, Josh Brolin, you know, goodness, who then become Thanos, you know, uh, decades later. If yep. you just, you know, get up in the morning, jump in a car and take him to a cave with a, you know, kind of full-size pirate ship and this uh, actual treasures and real coins to play with, you're not going to stand still, are you? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> so are you going to buy the 4K treasure chest? Uh, yes, so it's my, it's my birthday very soon, so it, it's happening. But uh, so, in terms of uh, the film itself, of course, the marketing was done back in the 1985 with the traditional means of radio, TV, posters, and so on. What is interesting, Roger, in terms of the marketing, then now the poster for the film was uh, something that was so kind of eye catching. I remember it to this day. Um, we have a scene of the actor, you know, the character Brandon, played by Josh Brolin, hanging on to a sal- salactite, and then all the other characters hanging on to each other's legs, making yes. all this line, you know, with essentially almost like a, a giant pit below them. But this image was never used just for for the poster of the film. And when the poster was designed, they use different characters in different orders because they didn't know how to, what to choose in the end. So whilst they settled on the Josh Brolin being probably the the male, the alpha male and the strongest character to hang on, um, they tried different characters in different orders uh, before they could settle and by error sent the wrong posters to the wrong people. So actually, depending where you lived, you would have had a different character leading the charge uh, on the poster. But when it comes to the DVD covers and whatever, it was essentially the group of them hanging over a chest full of gold coins. Fantastic. They didn't send out any posters where one of the characters appeared twice, did they? <laughs> Probably <laughs> happened. And then the other thing that they did was they published probably just after a storybook where the narrator was actually uh, Joe Pontigliano, one of the Fratelli mm-hmm. brothers. Joe Pontigliano, who went on to do so many movies, including The Matrix and Bad Boys and so on. I love this actor. I love him as a chief in, in Bad Boys as well. But... Um, when I was look, so I saw the film again last Christmas. Uh, interestingly, I've got the normal DVD, and watching it again, I was thinking some of it. Now looking back, must should have been a bit scary, but maybe mm. they got the humor just right because, mm. uh, as you say, Mama Fratelli, it was like a modern witch, wasn't she? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that that I mean that actress has just got a scary face, and she she knew how to use it to pump up the scares definitely definitely so the film was released on the 7th of june in 1985 we had to wait till november december for europe to get to get obviously the release of the the movies so it was filmed in a real town called astoria which is um, a, a town that is one of the oldest harbour towns in, in where we're filming, which I think was probably right for this idea of a 17th century you know, pirate ship and, and treasure. And the, the town then on the 7th of June, every 10, 5 years, has a big anniversary when they have a Goon's Day. Uh, Goonies <laughs> Day, should I say. And, and they have a big, big celebration, um, which, is, which is absolutely fabulous. 
I think it's uh, it, I love it when things like that happen. That that's a real community thing, isn't it? And, and and it just goes to show that a film like this can have such a lasting effect on the culture of a town or a, or a village. It's it's very very special. They spoke many times about doing a sequel and every time people say we just can't come up with a better story i think you know this is it and during lockdown and uh, there's an actor called josh gad which you would have seen in um quite a few comedies including um pixels if you know that uh, is it pixels mm -hmm. or pixels come on pixels so the, josh gad basically organized a um a little youtube series called reunited apart um, and he was having zoom calls with actors and directors and he successfully organize a Goonies reunion would you believe Fantastic. so all the actors and Richard Donner and Steven Spielberg including Cindy Lauper who sang the song uh, were on the zoom call with him and the guy was just about to implode with joy and <laughs> so they were discussing the film they even reenacted some of the scenes and they asked um, Steven Spielberg there which was essentially last April uh, what about a sequel and he said again I'm sorry guys you nailed it. We we can't uh, do better than that. And I wonder whether there's a lesson in that. Oh, yes. I think there is, Pascal. Quite often, I think, you know, I, I think TV series fall into this trap as well. You get one sequel too many or one season too many. And, and unfortunately, that can have a detrimental effect on the original. Uh, and, yeah, imagine had they put out a, a rubbish sequel it would have had a detrimental effect on this fabulous piece of entertainment. So great lesson, you know, if you absolutely nail it the first time, move on to something else. Absolutely. Now, there, there were video games, of course. You know, there was also the merchandise. Um, after the event, there was anniversaries, you know, 5, 10, I mean, 35 years ago. Can you imagine it? I'm so excited about it. One of the things you can do as well watching the film now um, is pick, obviously, some nods to other films, so which were done on purpose, but perhaps would have been easier to miss back in 1985. So there's nods to Gremlins um, in the film. There's nods to Superman, directed by Richard Donner. There's not too popular music. So one of the characters, I think it's uh, Curry Feldman, is seen wearing a Purple Rain t-shirt. But of <laughs> course, Prince had just released the Purple Rain album a year uh, ago in 1984. Um, Data, who, you know, played by actually the character K. Hugh Kwan, who was in Temple of Doom, mm. obviously produced um, by Steven Spielberg. He has a belt full of gadgets and he has written on, with a pen 007. And you've got all <laughs> this thing going on, um, you know, that you could miss. And it's also a pleasure to watch it in that way, not only picking up actors, supporting actors indeed, and what they've become, but also picking up all the 80s uh, kind of little nods. I'm going to use that little app that I talked about on last week's show that tells me where I can find the film or the TV show. That I'm going to make sure that this weekend, The Goonies is one of the ones on our list. So just to close on film marketing, so the box set has now been kind of issued and can, is available to buy online. All the different di digital channels are streaming the movie for rental and for purchase. But what has been interesting is the way in which Warner Brothers chose to promote you know, th this anniversary. And they've gone solely on Facebook. So they mm -hmm. have a Facebook page for the Goonies. And they've been uh, creating square videos with scenes of the film and then the call to action to buy the, the box set. And I thought it was fascinating that they've gone for a, you could argue, a very narrow cast form of, of marketing. What do you make of this? Again, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because the established wisdom would be, you know, with, a, with a, uh, such a popular film, you would think that they would have spread it out as wide as possible um, across all social media channels but possibly possibly they're thinking you know is it the age group that were young when like we were when Goonies first came out are probably more likely to be on the Facebook channel now as opposed to TikTok for example or Snapchat and that's where they're focusing because they're not trying to find a new audience for the Goonies perhaps maybe they're just trying to re-engage with those of us who have such fond memories of it from when we were younger 
No, absolutely. And, and I think the only way in which a younger audience will know about the Goonies is because their parents have told them about it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And forced them to watch it. Yeah, absolutely. Five times. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, Roger, we could keep talking about the Goonies, the actors and directors for much longer, but uh, we must reserve some of that for future episodes. Absolutely. <laughs> so once again, thank you so much, all our viewers and listeners, for your support. This was Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. Until next time, make sure that when you go out there, your marketing is done right. He was Roger Edwards, and I was Pascal Fintoni. See you on the next one.